everyone. Welcome back from what I hope was a really great lunch. <laughs> My name's Ann Gaviola, as you just heard with Global News. I'm a senior digital broadcast journalist. I also host a weekly biz business segment. It's called The Peak on Global. You guys should check it out on YouTube. Um, and I'm a national business reporter, so it is my absolute delight to be here with Peter. Um, first things first, because we have a, quite a lot to get into, and I'm going to ask the audience to think about whether or not they have questions that they'd like to ask as well. We'll get to that at the very end, if we have time left over. Uh, but before we dive into this great topic, I would love for you to explain your personal connection to generative AI and this whole space. Yeah, so uh, hi everyone, my name is Peter Shi. Um, I'm a growth investor at Maverick Private Equity. We're a uh, growth fund that specializes in investing in uh, disruptive technologies in generative AI and AI, AI um, has been very topical for us since it's one of those uh, technologies that permeates into every industry. And the concept of AI has been around for such a long time, ever since you know, movies and TV shows came out Think about you know a supremely in supremely intelligent robot. Think about you know R two D two from Star Wars or Wall E. They've been around for a long time, and you know it, generative AI is a layer on top of that that can permeate into almost almost every sector of vertical imaginable. So it's a technology that we've been following for a long time. And again, it's a technology that's very disruptive. Super interesting that you brought Wall E into this conversation. <laughs> Takes me back. Now, before we kind of dive deeper into this topic, I do want to set down kind of a foundation for everyone because I understand that there may be, you know, different levels of expertise, interest, and knowledge when it comes to AI in this crowd. I want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page at the same level just to start things off. So when we talk about AI, that encompasses so many different things. Artificial intelligence, right? It's so vast. Generative AI is a bucket within that broad category. Can you explain the, the difference? What are we talking about here when we talk about Gen AI? Yeah, so um, generative AI is different from AI um, in three ways. So A is that generative AI is able to understand the context of language. B is that it's able to synthesize large amounts of information and shorten it. And lastly, the generative and generative AI is it can create new data, whether it's in the form of text, um, images, video, but I think you know to to understand generative AI, um, it's important to have an appreciation for the history of, of the new technology, and I think the history is super fascinating because it has significant ties to Toronto. One of the godfathers of generative AI, Jeffrey Hinton, um, he's a British British uh, researcher, but he uh, taught and did his research at U of T. Um, and he split half of his time doing research at UFT in AI and half his time working at Google, which he recently quit, by the way. Um, and in the 1980s, Jeffrey Hinton invented the concept of neural networks, which is interesting because Jeffrey has a background in biology. Um, he wanted to create AI in the sense that it would mimic how the human brain works, so in terms of neurons and synapses. And his work in the 1980s um, all the way up to now created the foundation of AI and generative AI. And you know this will be topical for our conversation later, but Jeffrey purposely didn't want to do his research at an American institution because they were um, heavily tied to the military. And that's why he actively chose to do his research in Canada where he's less tied to the military. And he actually quit Google recently because he wanted to speak out about the truth or the, the risks associated with AI freely. And, and you know, Jeffrey, Hint Jeffrey Hinton was in Toronto for a long time and you know, he taught at U of T and he would have students. One of his students called Aiden Gomez, who would later go on to found Cohere, which is also a foundational model that competes with GPT based in Toronto. And Aiden also ha has a pretty interesting background as well. Um, in 2017, while he was working with uh, Google Brain, he, um, he was part of the team that published the seminal paper on transformers and attention. And that revolutionized uh, generative AI a few years ago because it allowed these LLMs or large language models to train on massive amounts of data. And that, that, that laid the foundation blocks for Google's Bard, OpenAI's ChatGPT, and ultimately Cohere. 
um, you know, there, there's a bunch of models that um, scientists use and researchers use to create, you know, the images that you type in, uh, you know, generates the pictures and responds to your text. And it comes with a lot of jargon. So one of them is called BAE, another is called GANs. I think the GANs is an interesting one to uh, talk a bit about because it illustrates some of the ingenuity behind um, neural networks and generative AI. So uh, GAN stands for, uh, apologies, Generative Adversarial Networks. And it's, it's essentially the concept that of pitting two supercomputers against each other. So if you think about, you know, you have computer A and computer B. If the goal was to generate a picture of a carrot, uh, computer A would, you know, try to, try to generate a picture based on the, the images that it studied. And computer B would take the picture of A and try to determine if it was a fake picture that was generated by a computer or a real picture of a carrot. And at the start, you know, computer A might create a picture of an orange blob that doesn't really look like a carrot. But over, you know, millions of permutations of trying random things, both computer A and computer B gets really, really good at, you know, discerning pictures and generating pictures such that when, when a user types in, please generate a picture of a carrot for me, computer A will be almost able to generate a hyper-realistic picture of a carrot that half the time computer B can't even decipher if it's you know real or a fake image. So next time you guys go on um, Diffusion, Stable Diffusion, ask them to generate a picture of your cat playing poker or something like that. Just know that there are you know thousands of these connections bouncing back and forth to, able to be able to generate one of these pictures. And that's just one way to illustrate how generative AI works. Yeah, I think a few of us have had uh, a little bit of time to kind of play around with the technology and see or at least get a little bit of an idea of what it can do. Um, and I, I guess a, a question is, like, is this technology that can learn? Forgive that kind of basic question, but is that part of it? Because it does seem to be progressively getting better with more input, right? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so Chad GPT, the one that's available to the public is based on 3.5. They came out with a new version 4.0, slightly different use cases. But what's interesting about GPT is that it caps the learning at 2021. So it only uses data up to, you know, two years ago. So today when I wanted to, you know, a few months ago when we were doing March Madness, I wanted them to, you know, predict my bracket for me. And I realized that they, they wouldn't be able to do it. So I think um, there's, there's these date cutoffs, but there's also the concept of um, these supercomputers that can learn from thousands and thousands of users at the same time. So when I'm talking to ChatGPT, you're talking to ChatGPT, the, the system is taking in information from thousands of users all at once, and it has the capacity to be smarter than any individual person. Like ChatGPT, for example, is trained on data that's equivalent to a quarter of the Library of Congress. So that's way more knowledge than any one person can accumulate over time. So it definitely has the capacity to learn, and you know, once newer versions of GPT comes out, they'll be able to incorporate hopefully the latest and even will be one of those live data sets. Okay, I, I like to uh, learn best from specific examples, and I think it's interesting when we break it down by industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the, maybe some of the killer apps that are being developed or that exist uh, from generative AI in, in specific industries? Um, I, I guess we can start things off with art and design, for example. Yeah, um, the one thing in art and design um, that I, I spend a lot of time is, is on uh, uh, video and film. So there's this company in Toronto called Monsters, Aliens, Robots, and Zombies. They're a VFX company, Mars. Um, they, they work on a lot of the Marvel movies everyone in here has probably seen. And the work is extremely tedious. Um, VFX artists go frame by frame and add in you know, monsters and you know, flying robots and everything. And uh, it's an industry I think that has been uh, antiquated and will likely be changed by generative AI in the future. And Mars has uh, been able to attract some of the top scientists that come out of Toronto uh, instead of you know them wanting to work at Google, Google Brain or um, GPT. They, they want to work at Mars because they're working on super innovative solutions. So one, one product that they have that uh, I think is really interesting is um, called LipDub AI. So imagine you're on Netflix, you're watching your favorite you know, Spanish show, you're watching Narcos or something, and you want to you see it dubbed in English. When you switch to that 
you'll know that the sounds that the actors are saying doesn't match the lips because it's dubbed. So what lip dub AI is, they will go in frame by frame and adjust the movement of the actor's mouth to match the English sound. And you know you can think this can be applied to any any dubbed uh, TV show or movie in the future. So this is one you know small example of how generative AI is changing changing uh, the world of video and film. But um, a lot of people also have a misconception that you know generative AI will take over video and film and you know create um, movies that are hyper personalized that you can create in five minutes. If anyone has seen the first episode of Black Mirror, you'll know you'll know what I'm talking about. Where yes. <laughs> where um, you know, shows are made by you like instantly, there's a show customized to you. I think we're, thank God, fortunately, long, long ways from that, but uh, this is just one small step towards, towards that. Super interesting, and I think it is interesting what we're seeing now uh, kind of unfolding in real time. I think a lot of us understood and wrapped our minds around the fact that AI could uh, create things that would take over those tedious tasks, but what we're seeing increasingly is AI that can take on some of those creative tasks, which, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I didn't think I would see, certainly not in my lifetime, and that certainly seems to be kind of the direction that it's headed in. Um, let's get into some other examples, because I think they're really important. Uh, in You've covered art and design, uh, you touched a little bit on film and video, and maybe even healthcare, I think, could be a, a big potential one. Yeah, one interesting, um End, end case is to use generative AI on uh, drug discoveries. So using generative AI to test out thousands and thousands of different compounds and molecules to discover if um, you know, there's anything special. And this used to be you know, a very manual, manual, tedious task as well. But once you feed it into a system, uh, 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 like a generative AI system, it's able to generate different uh, formulations, different uh, molecule compounds that could potentially be tested in the future. So it could significantly accelerate drug development in the future. Hmm. Uh, what about the legal field? Because I mean, I understand uh, you know, the use of AI to replace some of the tasks that you might assign to say the intern, um, but it's, it's much more complicated uh, than that, right? Yeah, I think the legal case is uh, extremely interesting because it's uh, an example of how um, you're able to use these LLMs to a very specific end case. So there's this company I've been following called Harvey.ai, and um, what they do is that they, they've built an, uh, a legal chat GPT on top of the GPT foundation model, and you know, and how they built that was that they, they fed the, uh, the system additional data, so they, they were feeding it case law. So you can ask the system to do legal-related activities like you know, doing due diligence, contract analysis, compliance, and things like that. So it's taking the GPT basis, but also feeding in the vertical specific data that makes it way more tailored to an end user who, you know, the end user would be a presumably a lawyer in a law firm or an in-house counsel. Can you give people some advice in terms of, like there's a lot of excitement around this topic, a lot of hype, a lot of buzz. How can people differentiate between the excitement about what is possible with this technology versus what's, what's really happening on the ground and, and maybe is in its very early stages. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one and one that in the investing world we, we struggle with every, every day because it's hard to discern what's real and what's transient. I, I feel like personally, um, you know, every two years we switch between crypto and AI, it's crypto and, and now it's back to AI. But I personally think that this time it's different because the, uh, the next wave in generative AI is backed by hardware. So one of the reasons why I think um, you know, the why now question is now is because there's been significant advancements in hardware and compute costs that enabled these you know, foundation models to train massive amounts of data at a commercially, uh, uh, at a price that makes sense commercially. So if you think about you know, the two components of hardware, you have NVIDIA leading the GPU race, uh, releasing chips that are you know, now may, way more affordable than it was five to 10 years ago. And you have all the cloud compute infrastructure set up by AWS and Google Cloud that enables these companies to host you know, these uh, computing, computing servers. So those two confluence of factors really enabled the development of generative AI where it wasn't possible five years ago. So the hardware advancement for me really um, gives me um, 
I find that compelling to answer the, the why now question. But in addition to the hardware, I think there's two other aspects that answer the why now. A is there's been, um, there's been increased social acceptance of the use of AI in general. You know, at the most basic sense, if you think about when you type in stuff on Google, before you even type three words, it's already, it already somehow knows what you're gonna ask. And if you think about, you know, scrolling on social media, on Instagram and TikTok, how the AI algorithm tailors content that it thinks that you would like. So we, we already have this sort of baseline acceptance of AI and how it could be uh, beneficial to users of it. And I think the last one is um, there's been developments in the applications that add immediate tangible value to our lives. So GPT, for example, um, a lot of people, a lot of people are using offshoots of that, such as Jasper in marketing, marketing applications, and people are depending on it. So it's delivering, it's confluence of hardware, social acceptance, and delivering immediate value. Yeah, I've played around with Chat GPT and was pleasantly surprised by um, how good it was at writing poetry and answering questions like, "How do you become a good manager?" Like it was just a, a, such a vast range of things. Um, now this is, it's funny that you mentioned crypto because uh, you're right, it, it, it comes back every once in a while and I, I left journalism briefly in uh, 2017, 2018 to go work in, in fintech and it was so interesting to see how quickly things move in that space. I imagine it is the same, perhaps even accelerated uh, in the AI space and this is something that's kind of having a moment. Um, Main Street is, is very aware of AI, very interested in it. I think lawmakers are wondering, you know, what are we going to do with this? And uh, there's kind of two camps that have emerged. And I understand this is a nuanced, complex subject. It's not just two sides. But there is that increasingly loud side of, of leaders in the tech space who are saying, we have to be careful with this. There's a, an existential threat in terms of what AI could become I if left of to its own devices. And then another group that's saying, no, 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 you don't even understand how much better our lives are going to become because of this. I think it's possible they're both kind of uh, right. Uh, what is your view and kind of where do you fall in terms of those two camps? Yeah, um, I think you're totally right. Um, there's always this tension of um, keeping the, uh, the people's interest in mind versus um, stifling um, innovation and, and investment. I think that um, absolutely that AI should be built responsibly. Um, I think it's a very powerful tool and it can you know, run away. So I think um, you know, everything needs to be in moderation. And there are several, several risks associated with um, AI. And if anyone has used chat GPT, you guys have probably seen a few of them. Um, and Jeffrey Hinton, for example, wrote an op-ed on, on some of the risks that he sees, which are much more sinister than the ones I see. Um, so the first one that I see is bias. So uh, GPT was trained on massive amounts of information and it, the information is that it's trained on is prejudice or racist in some way. Some of the output will likely be as well. So I think it's important to, if for, for companies building out their own engines to, to make sure that it's quality information going in such that it will be quality coming out. Um, there's also the problem of hallucination with with these LLMs. Um, you know, if you go on Twitter and search, you'll find you know thousands of amusing screenshots of wacky things that GPT will will spit out, and sometimes they're just factually incorrect. Um, but what, what I find whimsical is that you know we're humans too, and we embellish, we, you know, overstate, we misremember things as well. And it's interesting that, you know, the AI picks up on that and is almost a, a good representation of who we are as humans. On a, you know, obviously that will improve over time as the engine improves, but you know, we, we humans make those same prejudices and make the same mistakes as well. If you think about the Mandela effect, for example, it's a phenomenon where people remember events that didn't actually occur or people, um, misremember certain events and they, they honestly believe it's the truth. So not only do we as humans hallucinate, it's, it's interesting that GPT hallucinates as well. But um, Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, he, his views on the doomsday scenarios are a, a bit more negative than mine. So one of the ones we already talked about is, you know, because the model is a one-to-many uh, setup, 
you know, one model can talk to thousands and millions of people, it will accumulate knowledge to the point where, you know, it, it's way higher than any indiv individual person, which can theorists think that it can lead to the models becoming sentient or having um, ultimate goals that are different than what the, what the user wants. So an example of this is, um, you know, if a very talented developer or coder made uh, using AI wanted to uh, trade in the stock market, their ultimate profit is to, you know, make make um, make money based on the trade, and then the the AI can take that goal but do sub goals that are uh, harmful to others. So for one example is, um, you know, if the ultimate goal is to make a good return on a stock bet the the AI may be able to figure out some way to tank another stock and short it. At the end of the day, the AI will s will have completed its end goal of making a good return for the investors, but at the cost of um, tanking a stock, which is illegal, you know, stock market manipulation and all that. So it leads it it can lead to these situations where uh, the end goal is completed, but the side goals are very harmful to to, to uh, whoever or or the consequences can be unknown. So you're not quite on the, you know, Jeffrey Kitten uh, <laughs> scale of, you know, uh, very much doom and gloom. And I, I would say, you know, there are others who are even, you know, farther down that scale than he is. But uh, are you are you hopeful? Are you cautiously optimistic? Like, where do you fall? Yeah, I think um, I am really, really hopeful because I think we're in the early innings of generative AI and there's a lot more to come. Um, if I think about, um, you know, when I think about the value chain of generative AI, there's the hardware side, uh, there's the you know foundation model side, and the application side. And I think the application side is in you know very early premature stages, and we're going to see a lot of innovation come from that. And there's already a bunch of you know regulations we can talk about that stuff later. Regulations by countries that are coming up to ensure that AI is built responsibly. And I think that these two things can go hand in hand. We can build responsible AI, but also uh, drive innovation. I think in tech circles, there are sometimes the mantra of, you know, just move fast, break things along the way. I think it is interesting and slightly different than before uh, in terms of AI, where we're having conversations before it has properly being built out. And I think that's really important because what we've learned <laughs> throughout the history of human history is once the genie's out of the bottle, it is impossible to get it to go back in. Uh, in your line of work, when you're talking to founders and movers and shakers in the space, do you think that they are mindful and in intentional about uh, the the scope of the things that they're building out, with the understanding that in tech you can create something and then it you know becomes something else over time that you had no you, you couldn't even imagine uh, at, at the moment of its genesis, right? Do you think that the people who are building out um, this this ecosystem are aware of the potential unintentional consequences of their actions every step of the way? Absolutely. I think um, it's it's definitely at the top of mind for earlier stage companies who are thinking about building anything in the space because everyone knows that there will be you know rules and regulations that, that follow. And the interesting about uh, generative AI is that it needs such a massive amount of compute power to create something diabolical that really it's like the big tech companies are the only ones who'd be able to you know, make something like that. So I'm talking about Microsoft's OpenAI, Google, AWS. Um, for people building in the application space, it's less of a worry. Super interesting. Um, okay. What I'm always mindful of the audience that we're speaking to. What is what are some takeaways that you would like this audience of very many founders uh, to think about? Yeah, um, I think two two takeaways. So one is um, I already talked a bit about the, the value chain of generative AI. So if you think about the iPhone, the easiest example is um, an iPhone has the actual iPhone, the hardware, which I think equivalent to in generative AI terms would be the GPUs and the um, and the cloud compute. That that layer is already very mature. The second layer is the foundational model layer. So think about BAR, GPT, Cohere. That layer is also becoming mature because it's a, it's a game of scale. You need massive amounts of compute power and you need capital to compete in the space. But the area that isn't mature yet is the application layer. So um, this is a layer that is very early stage, and if I were to put my founder and entrepreneur hat on, this would be the area that I'd be building in. Because
because the iPhone is here, the operating system or the foundation model is here, but we're still waiting to find the next Uber app or the next Instagram app that will sit on top of GPT or Cohere or, or something else that will uh, create a lot of value. Obviously, you know, the earlier layers, the hardware and the, um, and the uh, foundation or model side creates a lot of value. There's still significant amount of value yet to be created. And that's one of the core investment themes at Maverick is that we're looking for the next Uber that's built on in, in generative AI. And another key takeaway is that um, I think everyone in the audience should know that regulation is coming. The EU is leading this. EU, uh, they're gonna pass an AI act in two to three years and it's gonna solidify um, some of the, uh, the cans and can't do's. And they, they work on a risk band spectrum. So a high risk activity would be you know, a social credit system, a medium risk activity would be a, a chatbot. And there are serious, serious fines to come for disobeying these laws. So for example, they're proposing that um, if a company uh, violates the AI, AI Act, they'll, be have, they'll have to pay 7% of their revenues or 40 million euros. So, and, and to put this into context, this is higher than Europe's GDPR laws on around data privacy. So. Once these laws come into effect, there will be you know, serious penalties and repercussions for violating the terms. But in the meanwhile, the EU and the US are working on a, uh, an AI code of conduct. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's meant to sort of bridge the AI, generative AI community before the law comes on you know, how you should be thinking about building your models, how you should be thinking about building AI responsibly. And this will come out in, in months time. So th there is a lot of things in the pipeline coming. In months, good. When you first mentioned that two to three year time span, I was like, wow, <laughs> the world could look very different in even a year from now. Um, I would love to get your predictions for AI because you've, you've seen a lot, you've seen what's happening in the space. Connect those dots. What do you see down the line in the future, near future? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I wrote this down, so I'm just gonna take a look. Yep, we want all the notes. <laughs> Um, so the first one is, um, this is more of a personal one, but I, I spent a lot of time reading the news on Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, I think there is gonna be a massive dilution of content. We've already seen how easy it is to ask ChatGPT to write an essay for college or university, how easy it is to write a, um, you know, an article based on any given topic. And if you've read any of the outputs, I would say that they are very, shallow, uninteresting, and frankly formulaic. And I think that there's gonna be a, you know, because it's so easy to create content like that, you know, it's easy for one person, an individual to spew out content and flood the market. I think there's gonna be uh, more attention towards quality human written content in the form, what, you know, whatever form, whether it's an article or a book or video or audio, um, because there's gonna be so much uninteresting content that comes. That's a hot take though. That's a hot take. Yeah. Maybe there should be some sort of branding like generated by a human to kind of differentiate the two. That's super yeah, that's, that's actually part of the laws that's coming in the EU's AI Act. As the, the specific law for generative AI is that it needs a disclaimer. So if something is assisted by generative AI, you'll need to put a, put a, a label on it, just like how you know people label food. Or advertisements on social media, which is not the most effective <laughs> thing. But yeah. yeah, go on. Uh, um, other predictions, it's super interesting. Yeah, um, so I already talked about the, the prediction that the um, application layer will be, uh, will be the layer that a lot of value will be built in and you know, it will likely come five years from now that the next Uber or Instagram will figure out the best way to use large language models like ChatGPT. Um, the third one is that um, AI must be built responsibly. One of the key reasons it generative AI is successful today, as I mentioned earlier, is because there's social acceptance. And um, there will be times in the future where AI messes up, and it, it already has messed up a bunch of times, um, that you know people it might push populations or it might push the, the general uh, sentiment that AI is harmful, and that could halt the development of it. So I think um, the social acceptance is really important. Um, I think there will be disruptions to the job market, um, just like how electricity upended uh, manufacturing. I think generative AI uh, may have an impact on the next generation of creative and knowledge workers. 
it's not to say that generative AI will uh, destroy jobs, but I think everyone should be able should be thinking about maybe working with generative AI in the future to learn it. Um, besides uh, AI and ML at Mavericks, I spent a lot of time in fintech. Specifically, um, I've been spending a lot of time in wealth tech recently. And one of the ways that generative AI is able to um, improve the li lives of wealth advisors is that you know the technology can make them way more efficient. You think about what a wealth advisor does all day. You know, it, half the time is talking to clients, but half the time it's balancing their portfolio of stocks, bonds, uh, etc. And and uh, I've I've been seeing wealth advisors who use AI powered tools. They're able to spend less time balancing portfolios and more time spending time with their clients. So in the past, if a wealth advisor uh, could have 50 clients with the help of AI, it, you know, it's able to make his or her work so much faster that the advisor is able to take on 20 more clients. And the advisor is able to focus more time on the higher level tasks rather than lower level tasks. The higher level tasks meaning you know, building trust among the client base and spending more time with the clients. So it's not to say that um, it will uh, take jobs away, but I think it will just be a, a new modality of work. So real emphasis on the sales aspect of it. Um, we're uh, running out of time, so I'm gonna ask you to share one more of your uh, predictions if you have another one. And I know that I promised uh, the opportunity for the audience to ask questions, but um, I, I, we don't have time for that. You can, however, find us on social media and continue the conversation there or uh, later on in the conference. Do you have another prediction or is that kind of I do have another one, but maybe I'll save it for, uh, for another time. Oh, you can't leave us hanging. <laughs> can you, Cole's notes? Cole's notes, yeah. embedded AI. I think that's the way of the future. Today we saw that Adobe Photoshop, for example, is in incorporating AI into their workflows. So for pe designers who use Photoshop all the time or the Adobe Suite, you know, you'll be able to access you know, generative AI tools on the fly in your current work streams without changing anything. So I think that's the way of the future. Always leave them wanting more. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. This is a delight. Thank you. <laughs>